I tried to keep my halftime breaks short in the middle of our dance classes, five or six minutes long. My students often tell me that today's talk is their favorite one, but today's talk is so much longer that I usually divide it into three parts, six minutes per day. This time, to give us more class time for dancing, I'm letting you watch it all together on this video. Okay, here's today's talk. A woman was interviewed in a Stanford study of women surviving or not surviving cancer. She mused philosophically, you know, the worst thing in life isn't to die. The worst thing is to have lived but missed it. That struck me as profound. It's one of the big picture awarenesses of life. This awareness actually changed my life for the better, but it also ties into social dancing. So that's my talk today, one of my longer talks, because there are so many ways that we can miss something by judging something negatively and pushing it away or not being as open and receptive as we can be, and other ways that I'll talk about, tying them into dancing and partnering. Now, this topic is not the same as wanting to be happy all of the time. It's not about being a Pollyanna. It's about having a sharp and clear perception of what is. So if the event that we're perceiving is negative, like a social or political injustice, then yes, we also need to experience that for what it is. But it's harder to see what is good in life and in people, because our culture gives us all too much encouragement to disapprove, complain, and reject. So my teachers in life are anyone who I found who is alive and receptive to the moment. Anyone who has the ability or talent or attitude to appreciate what's good in art or life and in people. Dale Stevens was one of my teachers, although he didn't know it. He was a film critic for my city's newspaper. He was always able to point out a wonderful aspect of a film that he just saw. Now, a film might have some shortcomings, but he would point out character nuances or effective cinematography or music or what the director did. He would help his readers get more out of their movie watching experience. He helped his readers appreciate films more. So I mentioned films because Dale was a rare film critic with a positive attitude. He was the opposite of the more typically critical efilmcritic.com. Um, that website was originally titled Bitch Slaps from Scott Weinberg, which is what most of his reviews were. Many critics think that finding faults is what a professional critic must do, negatively criticizing something. So looking at that dynamic closer, what is the essential process of the disdainful film critic? Comparative thinking is a large part of it usually comparing the film they watch to the best films they've ever seen and being disappointed that the current experience pales in comparison to the greats. So let's say we have a glass of wine. If you drink wine, do we simply enjoy that it tastes good or do we evaluate it as not one of the best wines we've had? If so, we've just changed a potentially positive experience into a disappointment. We missed it. It's the same with food. Is it tasty or nutritious or comforting? Or is it not the best version we've had? So our choice of attitude, that affects two things, both our receptivity, not missing it, and also our enjoyment of something. Now, if it actually tastes bad, or if an experience is painful, that's different. Then we acknowledge that fact. But many people push away something good because it's not as good as the better version that they're hoping for. Comparative thinking. Besides movie going, some people do this with their possessions. My phone isn't the best version anymore. I'm unhappy. Our consumer culture strongly influences this attitude. Of course, the advertising industry does not want us to be happy with who we are and with what we have. Advertisements train us to compare what we have to what they want us to buy and be unhappy with what we're lacking. Now, here's the point for social dancing. It's even worse if we do this with people instead of appreciating their good qualities. 
On the dance floor, you can be disappointed that you don't have one of the best partners in your arms. Or oppositely, you can find ways of appreciating your partner for who they are and not missing that moment, not missing them. You can be disappointed that the DJ isn't playing your favorite dance or your favorite song or that the tempo isn't the perfect tempo. Or you can find aspects of the experience that you can enjoy and appreciate. It's your choice. You can let all of these experiences into your life, or you can push them away and miss them. The point is that we can turn around the nosedive that our culture puts us into. We can consciously intend to miss less of life and of people and appreciate more. Now, critical thinking is developed at Stanford, of course, but our soundbite culture can reduce the idea of critical thinking to being negatively critical. No, our most productive creations, our most important decisions are generated by noticing positive qualities. It's by noticing what works, not by blocking things out. It's by being more receptive, being less judgmental, missing less of life. Now, an even more fundamental way that we miss something is prejudging that we don't like that kind of thing and pushing it away. It's too easy to only like what we already like, and people usually want to hear what they already believe. Confirmation bias. So one of the best ways to expand our life is to be open to new thoughts and experiences. The more possibilities that we're open to, the richer our life becomes, including more kinds of dance, learn other dance forms, and diversity in our friends and acquaintances. Next, have you heard of eschatology? Eschatology from the Greek eschaton, meaning the end of time, that's the fairly common belief held by various cultures for millennia that everything will be better in the end where everything that is imperfect will be made perfect. That, of course, presumes that it's not good now. So the problem with eschatology is that the good days are always deferred to the future. All goodness, justice, or healing, that's going to come later. Not today, but when we get there. So what does this have to do with dancing? Well, one way we often do this to ourselves is when taking dance classes. We can spend hours in class feeling that someday we'll be good at this, but at the moment, we're just not there. But we are there, in the middle of an enjoyable process, with both body and mind fully engaged, and with music, and with a partner in our arms. What could be better? Relish these moments. And then next, a double whammy. Perfectionism. Wanting something to be perfect combines the worst traits of comparative thinking and eschatology. Now, this is different from wanting to improve upon something. That's a good thing. Better is better. But perfect is usually impossible. Chasing after perfection is a prescription for unhappiness and frustration. So to clarify, it's good to aim high and strive to improve. But after you've tried your best, how do you feel about the results? How do you feel about others who are imperfect? Is perfectionism preventing you from appreciating your gains and from appreciating others for who they are? Is perfectionism preventing you from having fun? Now, artists know that there can be true beauty in the imperfect. And the imperfections are often more interesting than the flawless, perfect version. And then another way that we often dismiss something genuinely good is to complain that we've seen it before or something like it. Been there, done that. We have become a sampling culture, bored with something after we've sampled it once or twice. So if something seems overly familiar, try to find a fresh way to look at it, maybe from some new perspective. What else can you notice about it? Develop ways to look freshly at what has been taken for granted or seen before. Look for the extraordinary in the ordinary. And also reappreciate something that is ordinary. And sometimes it's as simple as reminding ourselves that just because we've seen it before doesn't mean that it's any less important. 
If it's a good thing, we take a moment to appreciate its value. Now, a large part of our life is how we interact with people, right? Since we're social animals. And the result of fully experiencing someone is as good for them as it is for us. Let me explain. We become aware of others and we acknowledge what is good in them. We see them. We admire them. We wish them well. We make a direct connection with them. And this benefits them as well as you not missing the moment. To be acknowledged, even in a small way, is a powerful thing. We can brighten someone's day, or we can make them feel bad by how we interact with them. And of course, all of this clearly relates to the two-way interaction of dance partnering and being in a relationship. Completely be there for your partners on the dance floor and off. Now, as I mentioned, a part of the process of appreciating something is refraining from pushing it away. It's intentionally accepting more of life, especially that which we cannot change. And that's acknowledged in the serenity prayer, as some people call it. Give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. And note that acceptance is given first priority over changing something. And also note the specification of changing things that should be changed. It's sometimes tempting to be a busybody, meddling in others' affairs, trying to change them into ways that we think that they should be. But maybe their behavior isn't something that needs to be changed. Maybe we can say to ourselves, I don't have to catch that ball and let others be themselves, including the way they like to dance. And next, acceptance also de-stresses our life. Many books have been written about the harmful effects of stress in our lives and ways to reduce stress. Have you taken any of Robert Sapolsky's classes here at Stanford on the ramifications of stress? But the aspect to mention now is that the more frequent acceptance of people and acceptance of life's happenstances significantly lowers our stress level. The tiniest disagreements or glitch in our plans can become a big stressful deal if our goal, conscious or unconscious, is to have everything work out in our favor. But life is rarely exactly the way we want it to be. People often don't act the way we would like them to. There are always going to be people who disagree with us, people who do things differently, and things that just don't work out. If we fight against this basic principle of life, we'll spend most of our life fighting hopeless battles and being generally unhappy with life and being stressed, low-grade, long-term stress. What we're doing, if we choose to live life this way, is allowing others' behavior to stress us, which not only disrupts our center, throwing us off balance, and making us unhappy, but it's a genuine health risk. I think you already know that stress is the emotion with the greatest weight of evidence connecting it to cardiovascular disease, a suppressed immune system, impaired memory, and irrational decision-making. Now, our response to this might be, but I can't help it. School is stressful. Work is stressful. This relationship is stressful. No. Stress is not what happens to us, although it often feels that way. Stress is how we respond to what's happening. And we do have some control over that, a lot of control. So I have a specific suggestion that works. Each time that we can say to ourselves, okay, I can live with that. That's a victory over stress. We can retain relatively calm peace of mind. We can continue to operate rationally with all channels fully open. Now, if we can't, then we can't. And occasionally we should not go along with something, perhaps taking a firm stand on an ethical issue. If Rosa Parks had said, okay, I can live with that, with having to sit in the back of the bus because she was black, then the civil rights movement would not have benefited by her taking a firm stand. But these hard stances are actually fairly rare in our daily lives you'll likely surprise yourself by how often you can say, okay, I can live with that. 
and be quite happy with the outcome, especially in social situations. And this way, with people, you end up stressing other people less at the same time, therefore helping them to be healthier as well. Now, reducing our stress level is important for health. But to return to my main topic today, acceptance is also one of the best ways to miss less of life. Accept it. Let it in. Now, another common way that we miss an experience is by being impatient either with someone or with oneself. Patience is not minding quite so much, something happening again for the 10th time. As with de-stressing a situation, when we start to feel impatient, we can start to say to ourselves, okay, I can live with this, and then pay full attention to the situation in front of us, fully engaging with the person we're with, instead of allowing impatience to tune them out. Especially cultivate patience when taking a dance class. Both you and your partner want to improve, not just yourself. Constantly be aware of small ways that you can help your partners get better. And the best way is being solidly there for them while being patient and kind and supportive if they're having trouble. Then take your improved patience into your work. Research, as you know, requires extreme patience. As experiments don't work the first time, research papers get rejected, then rejected again, and so on. Coding, especially debugging, takes patience. Then personal relationships, especially with a significant other. They will go much better with kind, gentle patience at all times. And wait until you have kids, if you do. Patience is one of the major factors in effective parenting. You don't want to allow impatience to block out those moments with your kids. Those years fly by too fast. Don't miss them. Now, patience, I know it's an acknowledged virtue, but saying thou shalt be patient, that sounds preachy. So no, I'm not saying that you should be patient. What I'm saying is that you'll be happier and wiser and friendlier and more successful if you cultivate patience. And you won't miss so many of those moments. So this overall topic is sometimes called mindfulness. And people tend to relate mindfulness with Far Eastern ways of thought, or mysticism, or philosophies. So I want to clarify that what I'm talking about is pragmatic, in a everyday, realistic way, regardless of one's religion or personal philosophy. And finally, there is one more way that we miss much of life. Not showing up. After all of our best intentions to be more aware and more receptive and not miss the moment, it's all for naught if we don't get up out of our comfortable chair. It's all too easy to feel lazy and want to stay home. It's too easy to say, I'm busy. So you can hear about all of these multidimensional benefits of social dancing, including as a way of practicing, not missing so much of life. You can hear them, you can agree with them, but nothing will improve until we get up, go out and do it, including going out dancing. Be more active, show up more. And dancing really is the perfect place to practice being fully aware and observant and receptive and open-minded and patient, and fully engaged in the moment with others, especially, yes, in the partnering dynamics of social dancing. Don't miss what life has to offer and what people have to offer. Practice being more receptive and not missing the moment.